As they rediscover the city, the veterans discover a memorial to a man who is referred to as the father of the nation, General Aung San. A friend and admirer of Netaji's, Aung San sought to adopt the same strategy, seeing in Britain's travails his country's opportunity, in Britain's enemy his country's ally. Commanding the Burmese National Army, he had helped the Japanese to defeat the British and then declared Burma independent. But he soon discovered that independence in a Japanese dispensation was a mirage. When the Allies began their attempt to regain Burma in 1945, Aung San and the Burmese National Army defected to the Allied side. Aung San was assassinated at the age of 37, just weeks before his final objective was achieved. Netaji and uh, General Aung San had established a very good relationship in Burma and uh, he had sent word secretly when the Burmese army defeat, decided to uh, break their relationship with the Japanese and to contact the British. So Netaji said, after all, the Burmese army is operating on their own side and they are independent to take whatever action they want to. But we are only using Burma as a stepping stone into going into India. So we must carry on our fight. And also, we would not like to desert the Japanese at this stage of the war. Only one request he made was that the Burmese army should not attack the INA because there was no question of the INA attacking them because our objective was India and nothing in Burma. And I must say that General Aung San, he kept his word and all during the remaining of the campaign, the Burmese army never attacked the INA. As she pays homage to Aung San, father of the Burmese nation, Captain Lakshmi ruminates on the irony that today Aung San Suu Kyi, the daughter of the man who gave his life 50 years ago, so that his country may obtain freedom from foreign rule, should be engaged in a struggle to preserve that very freedom. But her adversaries are not foreigners. Aung San Suu Kyi has never forgotten that she is the daughter of Burma's national hero. There is a certain inevitability about the way she assumes her father's mantle, accepting her duty to serve as a symbol, an icon, the crystallization of a nation's hope, its longing, its need to breathe free. What the veterans are so eagerly looking for is the house that served as the INA's supreme headquarters and where Netaji also stayed for some time. Will it still be there? Is the question they ask themselves. This is Chama House, Netaji used office in olden days. Omor was a child during the war, living on what was called Jamal Avenue. He recalls seeing many Indian soldiers in Rangoon and leads the veterans to a house where he remembers seeing Netaji. The veterans recognize the house. But this was just a house for the staff, not the supreme headquarters. Meher Unissa, now 69, has been living opposite this house for 65 years. Her father, Ibrahim Khan, was a close associate of General Shah Nawaz Khan. Memories of her first meeting with Netaji are still fresh in her mind. Mizar Salim or Sanewa Saab ne yahan par rehte the. Subhash Chandra Bose Saab to kabi kabi wo aate the aur kuch ek do din rehte the. Aur achanak ek din unka tabiyat kharaab hua, unko pechis ho gaya tha. To mere abba ne kaha ki dekho Netaji Saab ka tabiyat kharaab hua, beti to kuch. बना के भेजना है तो जी मैंने तो क्या कहा मूंग का दाल का खिचड़ी और पुदीना की चटनी और मैंने पीस के भेजे उन्होंने दो तीन दिन खाए खा के बहुत खुश हुआ और उनकी तबीयत भी अच्छा हुआ 
फिर उन्होंने एक चिट्ठी लिख के दिया है मुझे कि कटार कच्चा कटहार की तरकारी का तो उन्होंने लिख के दिया तो मैं उसी तरह वो लिखा वही तरह उससे भर के भी मैं मसाला डाल के उनको पका के भेजा तो बहुत खुशी हुआ फिर मैंने एक दिन कटहार का कुछ भजिया बना के भेजा तो वो भी खा के बहुत खुशी हुआ तो फिर उन्होंने मेरे अब्बा को कहा कि लड़की को मेरे पास बुला के आओ तो मुझे लेके गया तो मुझे कहा कि तुम क्या मांगता मांगो ये मैंने कहा मैं कुछ नहीं मांगता आप अच्छा हो गया आपकी तबीयत तो मुझे बस है तो उन्होंने मुझे फूल का हार पहनाए थे फिर अचानक ऐसा हुआ कि लोग जाने का हुक्म हो गया चला गया शाहनिवास साहब और नेताजी साहब जाके कहा था कि हम जाके आप लोग को वापस कुछ भेजेगा खत तो मैं खत का इंतजार अब तक करते थे तो कोई खत नहीं है ना शाहनिवास साहब का आया ना नेताजी साहब का आया तो कुछ हम लोग को तो कुछ खबर ही नहीं मिला यहाँ पर मेजर सलीम शाहनिवास और बहुत सा सब लोग यहाँ रहते थे इसी बिल्डिंग में Mehrunisa leads the veterans to what was once the supreme headquarters of the Azad Hind Fauj. Is jagah par laaye hain neta ji par baithte the. Ji. Aur isme Shaniwa saab baithte the, Mehzab Salim baithte the aur bahut sa saab log bhi aap sab log baithte the. Aap ye niche kamra mein the. Niche kamra mein the. Ji. To Captain Yadav. Ji. This is like a homecoming. Ji. Stationed here during the INA stay in Burma, he had many an occasion to observe Netaji from close quarters. Walking in this familiar courtyard, he can feel all over again the courage, resolution, and high degree of motivation the INA had reached by the beginning of 1944. The moment of truth had arrived. And on the 3rd of February, 1944, the first guerrilla regiment under General Shahnawaz began its move to the frontiers of India. The march to Delhi had begun. By early January of 1944, the INA had established its supreme headquarters in Rangoon. And by the end of the month, a full-scale attack was launched on two fronts, the Arakan and Imphal. While INA troops sped towards Imphal, Netaji established his advance headquarters at Maimyo, a small town in the hills east of Mandalay. With their advance headquarters now at Maimyo, the city of Mandalay became a transit center for the INA's troops. Mandalay, not Rangoon, is where Burma's past and present truly converge. It is the historic city from where Burmese kings rule the whole country and even now it reflects the cultural heartbeat of the Burmese people. Netaji's first contact with Mandalay was during the three years he spent in jail there between 1924 and 1927 as a prisoner of the British. Years later he would write, till then Mandalay was but a name to us. I had a hazy idea that it was the capital of the last independent kingdom of Burma. But I remember distinctly that it was the place where Lokmanya Tilak had been imprisoned for nearly six years, and later on, Lala Lajpat Rai for about a year. It gave us therefore some consolation and pride to feel that we were following in their footsteps. 
As we drove to the prison inside the fort, outlined against the morning sky, we saw beautiful structures, which we were told were the palace and state buildings of the old kingdom. The memory of the good old days that were no more produced a pang in our hearts, and we began to wonder when Burma would once more be able to fly her flag of independence. Nature's beauty and the tragic relics of Burma's history intertwine here in Mandalay. On the 20th of March, 1945, this fort was bombed so heavily by the British that the interior of the fabled Golden City was reduced to rubble and ashes. What remained was a broken shell, some walls and a moat. Today, a replica of the once magnificent palace is all there is to remind one of Burma's past glories. Captain Lakshmi returns to this palace half a century after she first discovered it. And as she walks through the palace, she relives her days here with the women of the Rani Jhansi regiment who were on their way to Maimyo. As the sound of her footsteps resound in these empty spaces, she can, even now, hear the laughter of her comrades and see the shine in their eyes, so certain were they of victory then. But through the laughter, she can also hear the cries and groans of the wounded as they were brought here from the Imphal front. In Mandalay, we were more or less confined to this fort area because going out was dangerous. The place was bristling with spies and they, must, they had been sending messages because uh, every time Netaji came, there was a very heavy bombardment. Netaji's headquarters had been moved to Maimyo because that was a very safe place and uh, Mandalay was so exposed. But he also expected only to stay in uh, Maimyo for a few weeks and then move on further to, towards the front. For months, this beautiful town on the edge of the Shan Plateau was to be the hub of the INA. Within a week of Bose's arrival in Maimyo, Captain Lakshmi brought up a contingent of the Rani Jhansi regiment. During the Imphal campaign, Maimyo was very important to us because it was here that Netaji established his advance headquarters. And uh, various uh, units of the INA were also based here. The Azad Hind Dal was also the advance party because they were to be the civilian forces when once we occupied various parts of India. They were also here and I brought up one unit of the Rani of Jhansi regiment also to Maimyo and uh, we started training here for, and preparing ourselves for advance. Maimyo had traditionally a strong Indian population and uh, due, to, due to the war most of the Burmese had fled the town and gone to various villages because they were afraid of being taken away by the Japanese to do uh, labor and later they were afraid of air raids. But the Indians stayed on here and they were most helpful to us in every way. Returning to Maimyo 50 years later, Captain Lakshmi didn't expect to find any of her colleagues. But a visit to a familiar house revealed Dr. Montu Banerjee. <laughs> Montu Banerjee was the main supplier of medicines to the INA and had become a close associate of Netaji's during the leader's stay in Maimyo. His sister Parul was in the Rani Jhansi regiment commanded by Captain Lakshmi. 
Today he guides her to the place where the regimental camp had been built all those years ago. I am very happy we have found this place because this building is exactly as it was when we had the Rani of Jhansi regiment camp here. But only this overgrown place that you see here was all nicely leveled as a field and we used to have our flag post here in the middle. Dr. Banerjee, now 84, leads a solitary existence here in Maimyo. And all he lives on are his memories. I possess nothing now. But still all people, when we meet each other, we remember those old days. You remember when I brought the one platoon of Rani of Jhansi Regiment girls and we came to your village. We went back very late. We got, got back to our camp <laughs> after midnight. Yeah, after midnight. Yeah. So, uh, Major Rashmi came to our camp, you know. It was late at night, that time, that road was full with tigers and bears and uh, then bears and even leopards. So we told them, don't take the rest. They said, no, we are after our soldiers. We got to go to the Kohima front. We'll, we'll advance with these few girls that are with me, we'll go to the front. I'm not afraid, not there. And they said, yes, we are not afraid, we'll go. And they started singing that national anthem, Subha Sukha Chayane Ki Barkha Barsi, Bharata Bhagya Hai Jaga. They started singing that and going, and Ham Dilli Dilli Jayenge, Ham Bigri Hin Banayenge. Now you play that on your yes, mouth organ. Yes. I remember you playing the mouth organ yes, those days. Yes. At every function you had to play. Yes. Acha bhai, I have the national anthem, I have to say that the Kaumi Tarana Sur Par जो नेताजी बहुत पसंद करता था हमको हमेशा बोला करते थे ये गाना आप हमेशा बजाया करो उसी लिए मैं आपको वही तराना फिर माउथ तो, लेकिन बाजा जो है वो जापानी और जर्मन बाजा ले ये चीना बाजा बजाने जाओ तो चीना सुर निकलता फिर भी मैं आपको चीना सुर में बाजा सुना दूंगा कौमी तराना The words may be a bit rusty and parts of the refrain forgotten, but his spirit is undiminished, as strong as before. For Captain Lakshmi, coming to Maimyo has been a journey of remembrance. Netaji's house 
stands exactly as it did during those war days. This house was privy to every fluctuation in the INA's fortunes. It was here that objectives were discussed, strategies devised, orders given and orders taken. Here, Netaji and the INA leadership swung between euphoria and despair as news of military victories and reverses trickled in. Captain Lakshmi was a frequent visitor to this house, often participating in discussions or receiving dignitaries. Today, only the walls remain, but they aren't silent. In her mind's eye, everything begins to come alive. Our INA troops were advancing towards Imphal and Netaji was preparing to follow them as soon as news of the fall of Imphal to our forces was heard and that we were now on the road to Delhi. <laughs> The Japanese and the INA had begun their offensive on the Imphal front in March of 1944. And on the 18th of that month, the INA had crossed the border. At last, they stood on Indian soil. In less than a month after that, Kohima had been surrounded. And on the 14th of April, 1944, Sardare Jung Colonel Shaukat Ali Malik hoisted the Indian flag at Moirang in Manipur. For the first time, the Indian flag could flutter proudly on its own territory. <laughs> 